Uh huh. Hey, man. Caught you. Yeah. How you doing, man? All right. Wow. Kind of caught me off guard out here, man. What's going on? I wanted the people to see what what happens when we record. Wow. Yeah, man. It's a uh, it's a great experience, man. But this uh this dilemma this dilemma called preaching is a challenge, right? And uh, just trying to trying to hook something up, man. Uh, that's uh, just practical. Um, something that people can use, and, and certainly something that's going to grow up up. But uh, this preaching thing, this preaching thing, man, it's it's a phenomenon, man. This thing trying to trying to reach people and reach them with a um, practical word that they can use um, that can be a benefit to them, to where they're confident in it. Yeah, it's 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 a. It's a difficult and a and a, a draining task. A lot of people think you just you just get up and start talking, but uh, there's a lot more to, to it than that. So, um, once again, need your prayer, need your prayer for me because we want to see if we can uh, make this word palatable to people to where they use it. Mm -hmm. Um. That's the biggest thing is will they will they use it? Um, it's a great Sunday morning therapy, but it needs to segue into a very everyday practical life. Are we able to make accomplish that virtually? Is, is this it's been six months or eight months or so since we've had church the regular way? How does that impact you? Now you just you just said something that really they really uh, elicited some thought. You said it's been six to eight months since we did church the regular way. But you didn't say it's been six to eight months since we did church. Mm. Wow. Now you just talking. But that's a very interesting distinction. Pastor's been six to eight months since we did church the regular way. Regular way as, as we know it. Regular way as we have done it. Uh, Mac, I think one of the biggest things that any pastor, um, this has been a learning experience for me, um, learning experience for everybody. We've never been through anything like this. And, uh, but what I found out is that first of all, we are the church. So let's, let's make sure, you know, we tell people don't, don't say synagogue Baptist church is closed. Um, we are the church, but I think what's interesting is getting people to recognize that the word of God is practical. That it's usable, that it, that we're not we're not trying to make it palatable just so you can quote it, so you can use it, so that people uh, will will go out and trust the word of God in the everyday in the everyday world. Um, because because my biggest thing, you know, people say, well, uh, we don't really need to assemble, you know, maybe we don't really need to come back. We need the assembly. We need to see people like I need to see your live testimony. I need to see you, I need to hear you say, uh, wow, Pastor, this is a tough week. But the Lord brought me through. I need to see, I need to see the wrinkles in your brow because you struggled with something, but now you got the victory. I need to see your tears. I, I, I need to see your anger. I need to know that that what I'm preaching and what I'm teaching, um, I need to know that the word of God has been manifested in your life as it is written, and it's doing all the things that it says it will do. And the only way I can know that is to see you, is to see people coming in saying, oh, you know, glad to see you, but it was a tough week. Glad to see you, but I had death in the family. Glad to see you, but I had to overcome this. How, 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 do, how, do, how, do, we, how do we interrogate the word of God if we don't see the manifestation of it? I got one more question, and I'm going right. to let you study. All right. Since this is virtual church and you are accustomed to hearing amens, would it help? If people typed amen in the chat box, would that be helpful to know that you are saying something that's helpful? I'm going to be honest with you. It, it won't help me not preaching. It won't help me a lot while I'm preaching, but it encouraged me later when I can look back and see that. Okay, because sometimes I'll be so focused on, on what I'm doing, I don't actually see it. But is it important? Yes. Um, it's important because then I know that you recognize the truth. 
Okay, because that's what amen means. Is that I agree that that that's truthful and I agree. Um, I I don't need it to preach. Um, it's, it's interesting because when I came to synagogue, there were no associates. We didn't have associates or anything like that. So for years, I, I preached without an amen. You know, from behind me. So you know, and 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 so I never taught it, and and even my associates never asked for them. It's not like we don't love them. Because now we know you recognize it, but honestly, um, just knowing that people are consistently looking at the sermon every Sunday, um, still want to look at it at ten o'clock, you know, not 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 two, which is cool, two, four, six, eight. I don't care when you look at it, but to be a part of that, uh, one, I think one of the reasons people do that at ten o'clock is to feel that live connection and say, oh, they're saying that right now. And they can see me right now. So for those who think, oh, we don't need to assemble. Now, will we be assembling in different ways even when we come back? Yes. Are, are there some things that I believe uh, are necessary and some things that aren't? Yes. But overall, man, my biggest thing is I need people praying for praying for us being able to discern this word so that people can use it and God can be God. All right. I'm going to let you back, get back to your study. Yeah, man, I'm yeah. going to do that. And uh, prayerfully, prayerfully, I can uh, say a word that, because for me, if I can get people to say, hmm, hmm, if I can just get them to think and appreciate God, then I believe there are a lot of other things they'll look at. So, so, so yeah, Matt, go, <laughs> go so I can uh, finish my business. Thank you very much. Did you know that God wants to use you in very special, unique ways? D did you know that God wants to specialize in using you to manifest his glory in the kingdom of God? Did you know that God wants others to see the light that he has sown in you? Hmm. I, I hear some people who are just ordinary people like me saying, who, me? God wants to use me. You really don't know me. You really don't know uh, my, my background. You really don't know my experiences I'm not certain God would want to use me. Well, I have some great news for you today. And I want to share with you from Matthew 5. And, and though I would like you to read that entire chapter, I'm just going to look at several verses um, that I want to really draw your attention to. But Matthew 5 is the Sermon on the Mount. And this is, this is Jesus' time of ushering in this new kingdom. He's ushering in this new kingdom. And he's, he's, he's giving people the information needed for them to understand how this kingdom differs from the, the kingdom that they were used to in their oppression in Rome. A new kingdom is being ushered in, but, but it's going to be ushered in in a way that they're simply not used to and, 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 and power will be delineated in ways that they just simply were not accustomed to. So it was important for them to know that this new kingdom that he was ushering in worked differently than the earthly kingdom they were accustomed to. So we find that um, Jesus is, is talking to, to, to the throngs, to the crowds, and I kind of want you to get an understanding of, of what these crowds, um, what they look like. They were often called the word a throng. He often spoke to throngs of people. So most times when you see crowds of people that were around Jesus during his time of teaching and preaching, I want you to kind of kind of feel this word throng. A crowd, a multitude of persons or of living beings pressing 
or pressed into a close body or assembling as a throng of people at a playhouse, a great multitude as of the heavenly throne. To crowd together, to press into a close body as a multitude of persons. Hmm. Much people followed him and thronged him, it says in Mark 5. So, so this is what's going on. Uh, Jesus is teaching this large multitude of people who are pressed together to, to hear this great teacher, but, but he's talking about something very unique to them, the ushering in of the new kingdom, and he, he talks about them in what we know to be the Beatitudes, which is uh, Matthew 5, 3 to 10. And he speaks of things that are the very opposite of the kingdom in which they currently live. And it was important for them to, to see that the kingdom that was being ushered in in power worked differently than the kingdom they were accustomed to. Look what he says in verse 3. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Well, in, in, in the Roman kingdom, the, the poor was not blessed. And so for, for, for them to hear that, that God blesses those who are poor, God blesses those who others think are worthless. Hmm. This was totally new to them. So like, what kind of kingdom is this? Well, you get an opportunity, you read those Beatitudes, on down through 10, and see what God is saying to these people as it relates to this new kingdom that's coming in, his kingdom. And he wanted them to understand the nuances and the differences of this kingdom as opposed to what they were used to. Well, look at verse one. It says, one day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up to the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them and he, uh, Segways right on into the, the Beatitudes. So now he's teaching his disciples. And I'm not so sure if he's so far away that the crowd can no longer hear him, but it's clear that he had clearly spoken to them. And they very well may have still been able to hear him now, but there was specificity in terms of his disciples. He really wanted to teach them something important and listen to what he says to them in verse 11. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. You, you will be distinctively different and you will stand out and you will be talked about, laughed at and ridiculed because all of these things uh, people are simply not used to in terms of the ushering in of this new kingdom. But he says, actually be happy about it. Be very glad for great rewards await you in heaven. And remember the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. God bless you if you talked about laughed at, ridiculed, ostracized. Don't worry about it. That's the cost of not being afraid to be different. And if you have any intentions of following Christ, you will come out looking different. And yet he wants to use us in miraculous ways. Now, one of the things I want you to, I want you to see about the disciples, because we love them and we, we have so much love and respect for them. We've learned so many things from their lives and their experiences. But listen to what he says to the disciples. And even though he's talking to the disciples, let, let me make this clear. This also applies to any Christian. To any lover of Christ, a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ. Okay, we're simply talking about followers. Followers are disciples. 
So it's not a special 12. Disciples mean students, followers, okay? He says to this group, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Then listen to what he says in 14. You are the light of the world. Like a city on the hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. Wow. You are the salt of the earth, he says to this group of men. But I want you to know that this was a motley group of men. All right. This was not your uniform regimented group of individuals. These were not the best and the finest individuals that you had ever met. These were not people who, who had so much commonality that there was never any friction among them. Let me, let me, let me, let me define this word motley. Because this truly, these 12 disciples were truly a motley group. Listen to what, what the definition of motley is. It's a non-uniform and undisciplined group of people. They are characterized by containing characters of conflicting personality, varying back various backgrounds, usually to the benefit of the group, a wide array of methods for overcoming adversity because there are so many different ways and, 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 and opinions that you oftentimes can come up with a solution, but, but not without much conflict. Motley group of men. Not, not, not a smooth, beautiful, well-oiled machine, but a motley group of individuals who often found themselves at odds not only with one another, but with Jesus himself. And those are the 12 he chose. But it's what he said to these 12. That is so awesome. And what he said to this, these 12 should help us in terms of being encouraged and realizing that, that, that God is not seeking out perfect people to manifest his perfect will. Hmm. He says to them, you are the salt of the earth. Wow. So Jesus is speaking to this motley group. He's speaking to these ordinary men with all types of faults, all types of hangups, ordinary problems, just like you and me. And he says, you are the salt of the earth. Wow. You are the salt of the earth. Now, here's what I liked about this. When you think of salt, when it's applied, it dissolves inward and disappears. And yes, we also know that salt was used as, as, as a preservative and how that can be uh, manifested in our lives by being, being able to endure and withstand but I want you to look at it from this standpoint in terms of just one of the applications. When salt is applied, it dissolves inward and disappears. So when he talks to these men, this motley group, he's, 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 he's actually saying salt speaks of the inward part of you, the character of a Christian, how you see things, how you discern things, what your motives are. It's not so much what you do as it is your motive for what you do. There are a lot of people who call themselves givers, but they only give to those who can afford to give back because they want it in return. 
So you can't deny the fact that they're givers. But what's their motive? If your only motive of giving is to be reciprocated, then that's not godly giving. So motives are important. So he said, he said, you are the salt of the earth. This motley group of 12 and all of the other throng who could hear him, it, it was also applicable to them. You are the salt of the earth. You, you are the ones that, that will show others, you will show the world what good godly character is all about. You, you're going to show the world how beautiful and wonderful the right motives are over what you get in return because you realize that though you're being mocked and laughed at and talked about because people say, oh, you just let people use you. I've been accused of that a lot of times, even from loved ones who are trying to look out for me. You know, don't just let people use you. Let me tell you something. You can never take more from me than God can give to me. As long as I'm doing it for the right reasons. So he says to, to, to this motley group. He says to these men who don't have a lot of commonality. After you look at the first four, the group is so diverse. Look at this. I want you to, I want you to get this. Let's look at the 12 disciples real quick. Peter, James, John, Andrew. Bartholomew, or known as Nathaniel, James, the lesser or younger, same person, Judas, Jude or Thaddeus, whichever name he used, Matthew or Levi, whichever name he used, Philip, Simon the Zealot, and Thomas. There's your 12 disciples. Well, the first four had a commonality because they were fishermen. And it's, it's, it's kind of unique. That's another story, another sermon at another time. It's kind of unique that the first four were men who had a commonality. But the others are so diverse and so different from one another that it's amazing that there's any unity at all. And yet Jesus says to this motley group, he says to these ordinary Flawed men. You are, you will become, you will be a manifestation of good character. Wow. You're the salt of the earth. Well, the one I want to look at the most, he goes on and say, and you are the light of the world. This, this word light is the same word, the same Greek word that Jesus used for himself. When he says, I am the light of the world. Same word. Wow. Same word he used for himself, he used for us. You are the light of the world. You, you are the illumination for others to see. Now, the salt of the earth is the inward character. The light is the outer manifestation of your life for others to see. <laughs> wow. You are the light of the world. And like a city on a hilltop, that cannot be hidden. That would probably be, be better translated that says, and like a city on a, on a mountaintop, that should not be hidden. A light should not be hidden. What good is it like? He says, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. What sense does it make to have a light that you're going to hide? Because light is designed to illuminate in darkness. <laughs> so look what he says. He says, you are the light of the world. You should be the manifestation of the light of Christ that's in you and your life's testimony ought to show the world that they should want to live a life like yours. You are the light of the world. Now we know that, 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 that Jesus was the ultimate light of perfection and righteousness and thus he says 
He's the light of the world. He's the ultimate light of perfection and righteousness. But here's, here's the beauty of this. Here's what I want you to get. For him to say that I am the light of the world, though. for him to say to this motley crew, they're no more a motley crew than I am with other Christians. A motley group of men that God got off the streets of Detroit and made a difference in our lives. No different. A motley group just like the disciples. No commonality, broken, fragmented issues, all kind of problems going on. And, and, and yet he says, you're the light of the world. Now, 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 now Jesus is the ultimate light. What, what I want you to understand is, look what he didn't say we were the light of. He didn't say we were the light of the church. He said we were the light of the world where darkness resides. Where light is necessary. You ever wonder why God puts you in uncomfortable situations instead of being around, you know, people who feel like you, laugh like you, love God like you, sing the same songs as you. See, that's what we want. And then he sticks you among people who don't love him. He sticks you among people who don't know one of your songs. He sticks you among people who don't understand any of your testimony. And the first thing we cry out is, Lord, why you put me in this group? He says, well, where should a light be except in a dark place? Why would you light up a lit room? <laughs> why, why, why should God send you to a place where there's only lovers of Christ? I mean, you tell me, why, why, why should God send you where everybody knows the hymns? Why should God send you to a place where everybody speaks the same language? Why should God send you a place where everybody feels the same way? Why would God send a light to a lit room? He says, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world because it is, it is the world that resides in darkness. Now, here's something I want you to get because God is always and will always use ordinary people. It's far more ordinary people than extraordinary. If God was simply going to use the extraordinary, he never would have used Israel as his people in the first place. He would have gotten the geniuses in Egypt. Why in the world would God use this flawed group of nomads to be his people except when God takes ordinary people like us, when God takes garbage like us, when God takes brokenness like us and provides us with wholeness, when God takes our fragmentations and simply allow them to be experiences to make us better, he gets the glory. If he takes the best, why would you brag about something that doesn't break down and it's the best piece of machinery in the country? Of course it doesn't break down. You've got the best of everything. The problem is the world is not full of the best. The world is not full of greatness. The world is not full of the extraordinary. We live in a world full of broken people, fragmented people, people have been, who have been crushed, people who have been treated unjustly, uh, poor people. We have, we have more of those. And don't just say, oh, they passed up responsibilities. The truth of the matter is everybody can't be the best. But look what God is, is helping us to see. I don't need the best. I'm the best. God doesn't need the best to work with. He made us all. So he knows where the best in me, somebody helps me. He knows where the best in me is. Even when I can't see it, when I don't understand it, God knows where the best in me is. And he knows how to get to it. He knows that I might have to go through some hardships for him to get to my best. 
that I might have to go through some trauma for him to get to my best. But because, because he made me and he's, he's my manufacturer, then he knows every nuance, every boat, every screw. He knows everything about me and he knows what it takes to get the best out of me. So he says to this motley group, you are the light of the world. It is morning. It is your faith in me. It's going to be your perseverance. It's going to be your overcoming. It's going to be all of those things that are going to glorify me. Because folk know you flow. And yet, I can keep getting the best out of you. So, 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 we're not the light of the church. That's Jesus. But we can be the light of the world. Now, here's what I don't want missed. When you talk about the word of God, you talk about something we talk about all the time, context and relativity. We are the light of the world is not something to boast about and get arrogant about. For me to be the light of the world, for me to, to, to be an instrument of God, to show others how good God is, does not speak to my greatness. It does not, it does not speak to my abilities. It does not speak to my talents. The, what, what it speaks to, first of all, is the greatness of God. But it also, from a relative standpoint, if I can be a light to the world with all of my flaws, all of my shortcomings, brokenness and fragmentation, if Jesus is kind enough and loving enough to say, you are the light of the world, he's also informing me of how dark the world must be. If I could be a light with all of my shortcomings, that ought to remind me of how dark the world must be. And I cannot trust it. I cannot lean upon my own understanding because if I am a light, then the world must be a dark place. If I am a light, then the world must be a broken place. If I am a light with all of my flaws, my motley group, with all of my shortcomings, it helps me to understand that that's not a place I want to trust because if I'm a light with all of my shortcomings, that's a dark place to live in. Man, it puts things in the right perspective for me. That's not a place I want to reside spiritually. That's not a place I want to trust. That's not a place I want to get myself to. That's not a place I want to be. Because if I'm a light, mm, if I'm a light, then God is great. If I'm a light, God is awesome. If I'm a light, God is everything he said he was. Look, how can I be a light? How can I be a light? He said, you're going to be a light with your testimony. You're going to be a light with your life. You're going to be a light with your growth. You're going to be a light over the years. You're going to be a light through your tears. You're going to be a light through your hardships. You're going to be a light because you didn't quit. You're going to be a light because you didn't go back to the world. You're going to be a light because you didn't give up on me. You're going to be a light because others said that it was a game with the preaching, but after 35 years, somebody else was wrong. There are so many ways God is going to use you as a light, and sometimes your best illumination comes after your tears. Your best illumination comes after bankruptcy. Your best illumination comes after divorce. It comes after heartache because even though you're flawed, you're still a light because the world is so dark. Mmm. Mmm. Don't get tricked by the world. The world is dark. It's a dark place and you're trusting it. It's a dark place and you're giving your allegiance to it. It's a dark place and you won't turn away from it. It's a dark place and it's broken your heart. It's a dark place and it's stolen your trust. It's a dark place. But you keep going back. And even as we struggle as Christians, I'm still a light. I'm still a light. You need a light in a dark place. 
Don't be afraid for God to stick to you in situations that ain't comfortable. He needs a light there. Just because your light ain't bright doesn't mean it doesn't illuminate at all. Just because your light ain't bright doesn't mean it's not hope to somebody else. Just because your light is not bright doesn't mean you don't bring others hope. So he says to this motley group, he says to these cussing fishermen, he says, he says to tax collectors who had cheated honest people out of their taxes. He said to, to men who had tempers and had, had hurt others. He said to men that he brought together despite their brokenness, you are the light of the world. Can't you hear him saying, who me? Some of y'all right now are saying, who me? You don't know how much weed I smoke. Who me? You don't know how much cocaine I sold. Who me? You don't know how I meandered my way through this world, lying and cheating. Who me? Yes, you couldn't be. Then who? Let me tell you something. God can use you. God wants to use you. If you've given your life to him, if you are now a child of God, I don't care what you've done. You are the light of the world. World. Who, me? Yes, you. Jesus said it. Mm. Mm. Because we can be the light to the world despite our flaws. No, it's not a reason to boast. But it's a reason for our humility to come forth and say, Lord, I don't know how you did it. Except you are a great God. I don't know how you use me. Except you are a great God. I don't know why you use me. Except you are a compassionate God. I just don't know, Lord, how I could be a light to the world. How I could be salt to the earth. And he said, I'm going to change your character. See, one of the things I loved about Jesus and I loved about God he would often change men's names in the Bible when he changed their character. I don't care what your character flaws are. God can change them. I don't care how dishonest you've been. God can change it. I don't care how long you've been a thief. God can change it. I don't care what your thoughts are. God can change it because I'm the salt of the earth. I'm the salt of the earth. My character can be something that somebody wants to follow if I let God use me. I'm telling you, I've come from a mighty long way, but I'm thanking God for all that he's done. I'm a light. I am a light in a dark place. I am the salt of the earth. I am somebody in the kingdom and I'm flawed. I'm broken. I'm fragmented. But let me tell you what Jesus said. You are the light of the earth. Who me? You. Who me? You. You are the light of the earth. I know you lied but you are light now. I know you cheated but you are light now. I know you've been dishonest. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Mm. I know what you've been, but you're mine now. You're mine now. And you are the salt of the earth. It's about what's going on in the inside. I know it's not being reflected on the outside yet, but you're learning, you're growing. You haven't gotten there yet. It's not reflected on the outside yet, but I'm changing the inside. And the more I change the inside, the brighter the outside will be. <clears throat> <laughs> Who me? You. You. With all of your flaws. You. With all of your lies. You. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You. Because I'm God. And I can use anybody, you. And when I think about this motley group, it makes me want to go back through. <laughs> Who, me? Yeah, Peter. <laughs> you. Who, me? Said James. Yeah, James, even with your temper. Peter, even with your mouth. Who me? John cries out. Who me? Says Andrew. Yes, you. The brothers of thunder. Who hurt anybody at the drop of a hat and drop the hat. 
Who me, Lord? But all of you says, who me, says James? Who, who, who me, says Judas? Interesting. There will be traitor. He was still valuable before he betrayed. <laughs> who me, Jude? Who me, says Matthew? Who me, says Philip? Who me, says Simon the Zealot? Who me, says the doubting Thomas? How could Jesus say something so astounding to such a motley group of people? I'll leave you with this idea and this thought, because we, we miss this a lot. Do you realize the reason Jesus, God, asks us to do things that seem, Lord, why are you asking me to do this? I'm, I, I haven't even gotten there yet. I'm, 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 I'm just growing as a Christian. I'm just starting to get serious over Bible study. Why are you asking me to do something so challenging and astounding. All right, let me help you. In almost 35 years of pastoring, you know what I found out? God will give you an assignment. Not based on where you are. Somebody help me. God will give you an assignment that doesn't seem to fit based on where you are. Because it's an indication of where he's going to take you. Good God Almighty. God will give you an assignment. And if you pay attention to the assignment and quit being so afraid, you realize how much God would have to do in you if he expected you to, to succeed. Which means if God asked me to do something that's a, beyond my capability, Somebody better help me. If God is asking me to do something that's beyond my capabilities, he must be getting ready to do something new in me. Why, well, Lord, you want me to, who, me? Yeah, Jake, me. Yeah. But, Lord, I can't do it. I know. It's beyond me. I know. I've never done that. I know, me, yes, because I'm not asking you to do it based on where you are. I'm telling you to do it based on where I'm taking you. <laughs> yes, who, me? Yes. Why, Lord? Because you're the salt of the earth and I'm already working on your character. I'm working on changing the inside. And you're the light of the world, so your testimony is going to be a brighter light on the outside. So I want to say to each and every one of you, listening to my voice, stop doubting what God sees in you. Stop doubting what he sees. God says, I see in darkness the same as I see in light. What you can see, I see. What the naked eye can't perceive, I see. If I tell you, let's go over to the other side, Tell somebody to take a picture of the other side for you. So you'll be familiar when you get there. Because if I say it, it's going to happen. Well, to all of you that are like me, just an ordinary guy, serving an extraordinary God. God says you're the salt of the earth and you're the light of the world. Start believing him. Even if you got some, some doubts, start walking in his direction. You don't have to be fully convinced. Just, okay, Lord, I, I don't see what you see, but okay, Lord. I don't get what you know, but 
Wow, Lord. I'm I'm afraid, but ooh we Lord. People gonna laugh at me, but okay. Because God is trying to get you to understand. I will never send you where I haven't been. <laughs> God don't make you well. So if I send you in the darkness, I've already been there to lead my light. You just follow my directions. So if you've been like me down through the years too, who me? It's time for us to just trust God, lean and depend on him. Because we are the salt of the earth and we are the light of the world. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. For your goodness, your kindness, and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your powerful, wonderful, illuminating word. We ask now, Lord, that you would touch the heart for those who have for so long doubted themselves and just don't want to trust you. Can we just ask you, Lord, if you, if we just help them with that first step? So, so sometimes, Lord, we, we're like the man who, who needs a second touch. And, 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 and even though you touched him, he said, but I, but I still see me in his trees. But the beautiful thing was he was blind, but, but, but he still saw me in his trees and you touched him again. So Lord, if this is somebody you need to touch again because of their fears, please touch them. Help them to realize that if you say we're the solid earth, then we are. If you say we're the light of the world, then we are. We thank you for your unconditional and undying love. Jesus, we pray. It has certainly been an absolute joy and pleasure to serve today in preparing the Word of God and hopefully delivering it to the point where it's palatable for you. Now, I'd like you to do several things. Um, one of those is we'd like to ask everyone who, if you're still with us and gave a listening ear and you were blessed, if you would subscribe to our YouTube page um, and share it with people in, in your social surroundings, however you do that. Um, I certainly want to say to Senegal Baptist Church uh, family, we continually need your giving, your agape giving, giving out of love, not fear, not curses, all of that. Giving out of love because God has been good to you and continue to support our church, anyone else who gives. And we thank God for anyone who will help us in our ministries. Uh, that's serendipity. Um, and we, we thank you for it, but our responsibility, Son of God, is, is ours. And so we ask you to continue to um, to send your contributions um, to PayPal, through uh, sending a check, a money order uh, to the church cash app, however uh, you may do that. We ask that you would continue to do that. And also, remember, this is our um, 71st anniversary uh, this month. October. So, I have not been mentioning any figures for the last uh, two months, but I am now because this is the month we're asking every working person uh, to give um, $200 to our uh, church anniversary. This is our anniversary, and we want to raise enough funds to do the things that we need to do to continue to bring uh, quality service uh, to our listeners, to our congregation. Um, there are still a number of uh, uh, improvement things that are going on at the church that are expensive, from painting to new equipment, um, lightings, all kinds of things to make our experience better. We're the ones that have to support you. So uh, we're asking that. Uh, we've got the entire month. Um, it's not new. We've been doing this same. We, have, we haven't raised it, anything. We haven't asked for more money. Same amount. I know for 15 years. It never changes, and it comes every year. So, if you're not prepared to do it, then it shows that you haven't made it a discipline to do so. Not a knock, it's to say to you, let's do better and give what you can this year, be prepared to do it next year. But all of those who can and are working and can, we're asking for $300 per person, working person in the house. Uh, please pray for a uh, number of our sick and uh, shut in. There are a lot of things going on. I don't want to get into names because I don't want to miss things. 
can always give it our subcommittee. But please just pray. Pray for the leadership here. Pray for all the ministries people are working very hard to um, to, to 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 get ministries to you um, in a very qualitative way. And so we're asking that you will pray for that. Um, and just keep us all in uh, perfect peace. Now, as we as we get ready to to end these services, I want to um, I want to just take a moment to to just pray for anybody that has let your lack of confidence um, make you feel that God can't use you. Just because you don't think much of you doesn't mean you're not using. That's the devil trying to trick you. Just because you just came off of a failure doesn't mean God doesn't have uh, something for you to do. So just very quickly, Lord, please help us to separate losing from loser. Please help us to understand that as finite beings, we fail, we come up short. Please help us to understand that you are so willing to use broken pieces. So I don't know, I don't know any names and I can't see any faces. I just know they're there. So would you please, whatever their names may be and whatever city or state they may live in, whatever country they may live in, they can hear my voice. Lord, touch that person who feels like a failure and let him know that's the work of the devil. Touch the person who just suffered defeat and he's defined himself by that defeat. That's the work of the devil. We ask you to touch each and every one of your children. Uh, make us stronger. And then touch that sinner who just doesn't want any part of you. Let the Holy Spirit reach him that he might one day, if not this day, make you his Lord and Savior. We ask this in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you have never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, today's your day. I suggest you do that today. Um, Jesus died on the cross for all of your sins and mine. That's what he came to earth for, died on the cross. They killed him, they buried him, and on the third day, he was raised up with all power, all authority to make me right with God. If you're not right with God through Jesus Christ, then you're not living life. Life is beautiful. Knowing that I don't have to live based on luck or circumstance or happenstance that God has a plan for me. So it's nothing that you need to do, nothing miraculous, to simply receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Ask him to come into your life. He won't break an inner. But if you ask him to come in and you receive him as your Lord and Savior, he will save you today. And it's not going to fix everything that's going on in your life, but it will set your eternity in the right place. And the more you allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life, the better this life is going to be. So receive him today as your Lord and Savior. Find your Bible teaching, preaching church and ask them to lead you in this journey of Christianity. God bless each and every one of you. Have a tremendously blessed day, and you pray for me, and I'm just going to pray for God's people in general. God bless each and every one of you. Have a great day.